Can you hear anything? There we go. Good morning. The Unitarian Church of Montpelier is located on Western Abenaki land, which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples. The Unitarian Church of Montpelier honors, recognizes, and respects these peoples as the traditional and ongoing stewards of the lands and waters on which we gather. In that same spirit, we will respect protect and be good stewards of this land for as long as we walk upon it. My name is Margot Prendergast and as today's worship associate, I welcome you on this beautiful frosty morning. Thank you for joining us in this time of worship from wherever you are, whether you are on Zoom, on Facebook or watching the service on your own time we deeply appreciate your presence and fellowship. The Unitarian Church of, Mont of Montpelier is a Unitarian Universalist congregation founded in 1864. We are a religious community that welcomes all as we journey together seeking spiritual wholeness and justice in this world that we live in. Whether you are a newcomer, a longtime member, or somewhere in between, you are part of our community and we are glad you are here. If you are joining us in Zoom, the chat function will be on for much of the service. It is a great way to publicly welcome and support one another, to affirm the hard work and effort of our worship team and to share good vibes and positive thoughts with each other. For technical issues or constructive thoughts, please private message one of our Zoom hosts indicated with an asterisk by their name, or join us for coffee hour after this service to share them there. Thank you to our virtual greeters who are offering hospitality and help, tech help throughout the service. Additionally, on Zoom, click on the live transcript button wherever it lives on your screen for increased accessibility. I have a few brief announcements about the life of our congregation. The UCM racial justice group members will be available at coffee hour to chat about the eighth principle. We will also be joined by the Planned Parenthood Central Vermont organizer during coffee hour who will be available to share more information about Proposition 5. All, finally, Please read the weekly e-newsletter to learn more about the many upcoming events in our church community. And now let us enter more deeply into our time of worship with our prelude.
Good morning. I am the Reverend Joan Javier Duval, and I use she, her pronouns. Today, we join Unitarian Universalist congregations across the country for a Sunday of solidarity, support, and reflection to commemorate the anniversary of Roe versus Wade and the ongoing fight for reproductive health, rights, and justice. Our opening words are written by the Reverend Dr. Deborah W. Hafner. And these words include the refrain, you are welcome here. As I share these words of welcome, you may hear an aspect of your identity or life experience named. If you do, I invite you to say to yourself or aloud, I am welcome here. You are welcome here. If you are straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, intersexual, demisexual, pansexual or asexual, or resist labels completely, you are whole and welcome here. If you are transgender, non-binary, genderqueer or cisgender, you are whole and welcome here. If you are confused about your sexuality, have questions, struggle in an intimate relationship or struggle because you aren't in one, you are whole and welcome here. If you have had an abortion or an unintended pregnancy, given up a child, had a miscarriage, have AIDS or HIV, struggle with infertility or sexual dysfunction, you are whole and welcome here. If you have been the victim of sexual abuse, sexual harassment, or sexual assault, you, you are whole and welcome here. If you have made sexual decisions or had behaviors that you regret, you are welcome here and we will help you offer restorative justice and healing. Your sexuality is holy and sacred and an integral part of who you are. You are whole and welcome here. As Unitarian Universalists, we will side with you, love you, and fight for your rights. We seek to create a world where sexuality and sexual diversity is celebrated with holiness and integrity. Good morning. Two years after Roe versus Wade was decided, the United Nations declared that year, 1975, International Women's Year, and they organized the first World Conference on Women. Also in 1975, in the middle of this seminal decade for women's and reproductive rights, Carol Etzler Eaglehart wrote some new words to the tune, We Are Climbing Jacob's Ladder. Please now join Carolyn's angel band in singing our opening hymn, We Are Dancing Sarah's Circle.
Hi, I'm Brenda Bean. Uh, many of you may know uh, me and my husband, Phil Morse. You may not have known me during my first marriage, which when I was ages 20 to 30. When I was 25, um, I went through a significant life event. My then husband and I had discussed having a baby and at one point we did not use contraception. I got pregnant and um, then reluctantly we decided to not go through with the pregnancy. Given where and when I was living in central Vermont in the 1970s, I was able to have a legal abortion. It was only a year or two earlier that um, a safe professional clinic was established in Vermont to provide the necessary care. I'm speaking about the abortion now because I'm very concerned that young parents, especially young women, are being systematically forced into making choices that aren't necessarily the best for them. Republican-ruled states have been busy removing their choices. I dearly hope that our legislature and the voters in Vermont um, prevent this from happening here. Now, I invite you to join Phil and me in lighting a chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, in honor of human dignity and wholeness. We are expressing faith that uh, reproductive freedom can be retained here and in other places regained. Thank you, Brenda and Phil. Please join me now in saying our congregational covenant. We covenant to speak honestly and listen deeply to each other and the voice within. Treat each other with compassion and honor our differences. Take responsibility for the impact of our words, actions, and inactions have on each other. Support each other in times of grief and need and celebrate the beauty and joy in our lives. Honor the gifts of the past and be gentle with each other as we grow. Encourage each other in the brave work of creating a more beloved community and a healthy, sustainable world. And forgive each other and start again. Let me say, a special hello to any children and younger people who might be watching our service this morning. I want to share a time for all ages with you and with all of the adults who are tuned into worship. During today's service, we are talking about topics that have to do with our bodies, our heads, our shoulders, our knees and toes, and everything in between. Especially as we get older, we get to make all kinds of decisions about our bodies. Just this morning, you might have chosen a chair to sit in or a special spot to lie down and rest. You might have listened to your body telling you that you were hungry or that you had had enough to eat. Maybe you just had to get up and dance with your body because that was what your body was telling you to do this morning. Our bodies are very special and deserve to be cared for and treated with respect. And when it comes down to it, you, yes, you are really the only one who's in charge of your own body. An organization called The Mother Company put together a music video that shares this message. And I thought that you would all really enjoy watching it. If you're inspired to, you can dance and move along with the video, but that will be totally up to you.
Who's the boss? I'm the boss. Who's the boss? I'm the boss. Of what? My body. Of what, what? My body. Yeah. I knew a boy who played a little too rough. Thought he was so tough, he would push and shove. This kid stood a little too close. Stepping on toes, getting nose to nose. Then one day I stood up, said, I'm tired of all your rough stuff. Keep your hands to yourself, I've had enough. I'm taking control of me. Venturing past where the sidewalk ends They made a case for a bicycle race hey. Through a dangerous place hey. where they wouldn't be safe Then she got that uh -oh, uh -oh. Feeling what she do with her uh -oh, uh -oh. Feeling She let the scene say I gotta protect me I gotta protect me I'm me. I'm my own referee. My own personal MC. Top billing on the marquee. Commander in chief. The grand poop of big cheese. I'm, I'm the, the boss of, of my body. body. Who's the boss? I'm the boss. Who's the boss? I'm the boss. Of what? My body. Of what? What? My body. Who's the boss? I'm the boss. Who's the boss? Our generosity is a form of love and gratitude. Our gifts freely given help us to practice Unitarian Universalism within and beyond our congregation. Each month through the UCM Community Pouch Program, we share part of our collection with an important church fund or a community organization aligned with our values. During the month of January, our community pouch recipients are Vermont Relief Connect Collective and Salon Black Walnut. Both groups are led by people of color and build culture through connecting people, land, and food ways here in Vermont. Your contribution to the UCM community pouch this month will directly support this work. You can make a financial contribution today by donating online. Go to ucmvt.org and click Donate to UCM. There are options to contribute to the general fund, which su supports the general operating budget of the church, the community pouch, or both. You can also mail a check to the church or you can use our text to give option. Simply send a text message with the word give to 802-266-4848 and follow the instructions sent to you. We are so grateful to each and every one of you for your generosity in its many forms. While the offering is being given and gratefully received, Please enjoy a reflection and musical offering from Bronwyn Fryer. This is the story of my abortion. It's 1988 and I'm living south of San Francisco when I find myself pregnant. My then husband and I receive the news happily. Other than bouts of morning sickness, everything goes swimmingly through the first trimester. I feel my baby moving in around four months or so and I go in for an amniocentesis test. 
at the recommended 17 weeks. It takes about two weeks to get the results, and they are both devastating and unquestionable. My baby girl has a severe genetic defect called trisomy 13, also called Patau syndrome. Trisomy 13 is a chromosomal condition that causes severe intellectual disability, heart defects, brain and spinal cord abnormalities, poorly developed eyes, additional fingers and toes, cleft lip, and weak muscles. Most infants with trisomy 13 die within their first days or weeks of life if they make it that far. As much as I want her, there's no question of carrying this baby to term. Not only because caring for this ill-fated child would be impossible under our circumstances, but because I was frightened by what had happened to my own mother. She became pregnant with her fourth child when I was two, and he died in utero at eight months. Back in the 50s, the only option available for her was to deliver the baby naturally. So she carried him knowing he was dead until he was born at nine months. The experience drove her into terrible postpartum depression from which she never recovered. By the time I was five years old, she'd devolved into paranoid schizophrenia. When I was 12, she was institutionalized. She received 35 shock treatments that did nothing to restore her mental health, and she died when I was 17. I felt that I, too, could be driven into unrecoverable depression myself if the situation continued. So I finally received my abortion at 22 weeks after a difficult search for a provider. My milk came in afterwards, and I cried for weeks. The moral of the story is this. Forcing a woman to have even a wanted but seriously deformed baby can be devastating. Just imagine what it's like for desperate women in Texas right now. But fast forward to a happier day. October 2nd of last year was a rainy day in, here in Montpelier, not long after Texas had passed its draconian anti-abortion law, which the Supreme Court refused to strike down. Hundreds of people came out in the pouring rain to stand up for reproductive freedom. I strapped on my guitar and I sang this song, written by my friend Patty Casey.
Thank you so much, Bronwyn. Indeed, we are stronger than that. I invite you now into our time of meditation and prayer, a time that we set aside for settling into quiet reflection and for tuning into the condition of our hearts and spirits. We begin by acknowledging the joys and the sorrows that we bring with us into this time of worship. You may be celebrating something special in your life or feeling grateful for a particular person or experience. You may be facing a challenge or a loss that is heavy on your heart. We acknowledge the collective pain that we feel in the face of the ongoing COVID pandemic and the social and environmental crises that cause suffering so, for so many people and our planet. May we hold all that is present with compassion. And in the spirit of community, we set aside time during each service to share these personal joys and sorrows with one another. Today, you are welcome to share in the Zoom chat or in the Facebook comments for others to read. We ask that you share only those joys and concerns that are personal to you. If you have a concern to share that pertains to another member of our church community, please do ask permission before sharing that on their behalf. Now you are welcome to share your joys and concerns in the Zoom chat or the Facebook comments so that we might offer one another our care and support. Art Stuckey is our lay pastoral caregiver this morning. He is available to lend a listening ear of care after the worship service. Art's phone number will be shared in the Zoom chat and is also available in the church directory. May you know that you are held in the love of this community and the expansive love that moves beyond us. Many people are mourning the passing of the Buddhist teacher and writer Thich Nhat Hanh, who died yesterday at the age of 95. He shared with his students and the world many wise words including the following. Our true home is in the present moment. To live in the present moment is a miracle. The miracle is not to walk on water. The miracle is to walk on the green earth in the present moment, to appreciate the peace and beauty that are available now. Peace is all around us, in the world and in nature and within us, in our bodies and our spirits. Once we learn to touch this peace, we will be healed and transformed. It is not a matter of faith, it is a matter of practice. We need only to find ways to bring our body and mind back to the present moment so we can touch what is refreshing, healing, and wondrous. I invite you to take a breath with me. Staying in this present moment with our bodies and our minds, I share with you this body blessing by the Reverend Lisa Bovey Kemper. You are welcome to touch your hands to your forehead if it feels natural. May you be blessed with wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. May your intellect take you far on your journey. You have been blessed with reason and free will. It is your call every day to use these gifts. Bringing your hands 
to your throat. May you be blessed with voice. May you learn the complex nature of truth telling. The ability to speak the truth in love is something that requires honesty, empathy, and care. You are challenged every day to seek the joy that comes with sharing your truth compassionately, as well as listening to others. Bringing your hands to your heart. May your heart be full and blessed with love. May you know the agony of heartbreak as it is intertwined with the elation of love. Your heart is a strong and resilient organ, one that will be with you until the end of your time on earth. May you heed the wisdom of your heart and always trust the truth it tells. Bringing your hands to your abdomen. You are blessed with the gift of sexuality. May you always remember that you are a beloved child of the divine. Your body is sacred and belongs to you alone. May you live into the full expression of your identity as a human being, embracing your true sexual and gender identity. The gift of sexuality brings with it many rewards as well as great responsibility. May you always retain power over your own being, striving toward mutually fulfilling and just relationship. Bringing your attention to your hands. When you were a baby, your tiny hands were your first contact with the world. Before you could see more than a few feet in front of your face, you grasped the finger of your loved ones. You catch yourself with your hands when you fall and you express love and comfort to others with them too. May your hands be gentle and strong. May you use them to carry light into the darkness and rest to the weary. May your hands always find the place of greatest need beginning with your own. And may the creator of all things hold you in the palm of her hand wherever you go. And wrapping your arms around your whole body May you be blessed on your journey. May you remember that growth happens on the journey and that you are never alone. May you always remember that you are a whole person, that each of these parts work together. We offer blessings upon you, body, mind, and spirit. May you be guided by compassion and truth, justice and love. May you find rest on the journey, always remembering where you came from, being mindful that your ancestors stand behind you, whether we are present on earth or have gone back to the soul of the world. May you be blessed in all things, and carry blessings with you wherever you go. And let us join now in a brief time of quiet meditation.
One fall afternoon when I was 18 years old, I sat across from the director of what was then called the Greater Philadelphia Women's Medical Fund. She glanced at my application for the position of telephone loan counselor and asked, so you were raised Catholic, how did you end up here? I had happened upon the job opening when looking for a position that would fulfill the federal work study requirements of my college financial aid package. The director hadn't up to that point encountered anyone with a Catholic upbringing who wanted to work at an abortion fund. At this point in my life, I was a strongly questioning Catholic and was in a process of discovery with my sexuality and feminism and until I had seen the job opening, I didn't know what an abortion fund was. The Greater Philadelphia Women's Medical Fund, now the Abortion Liberation Fund of Pennsylvania, was established by healthcare workers and women's rights activists in 1985 in response to the Pennsylvania Abortion Control Act, which prevented women from using Medicaid to pay for abortion care. The telephone loan counselors responded to messages left by women, sometimes girls, who had decided to get an abortion but couldn't pay, couldn't afford to pay the out-of-pocket costs. Despite the director's initial reservations, I got the job and I spent two days a week at the fund office responding to loan requests. I spoke with women from across the city of Philadelphia and its suburbs most of whom were poor or low income, many of whom were Black, Latina, and Asian. I soon discovered that I had a lot in common with the women I spoke to each week, a desire to be safe, healthy, and happy, a dependence on the services of medical professionals to ensure my health, a need for connection to a broader community who could offer care and support in the face of gender-based barriers. I also discovered differences between myself and the women I spoke to. Many of these were due to differences in access to economic and educational opportunity and privilege. I had reliable, stable housing. Many of them did not. I had 24-hour access to clinical health services. Most of them did not. And while I was working my way through college, I also came from a solidly middle-class family and knew I could rely on my parents for financial support. This kind of financial stability was not available to the women I spoke with who needed the fund's assistance, or if it was, they were not likely to receive help to pay for their abortions. It would be many years later until my first and then second pregnancies and a more intimate understanding of the questions and issues that arise at the prospect of bringing a baby into the world. My partner and I chose to become parents. I was able to conceive and carry a healthy pregnancy to full term. One week after my due date, my midwife heard an irregularity in our baby's heartbeat and sent me straight to the hospital from her office. Our son was delivered by emergency C-section. I became a mother at a time of my choosing and with no question of having reliable medical options, a fact that I am grateful for. When our son was five years old, my spouse and I got pregnant a second time. After eight weeks, the embryo stopped growing and I did not carry that pregnancy through to its full development. Instead, I was able to use my own sacred conscience, the consultation of my doctor and spouse, and the stirrings of my own heart to make the painful decision to have that miscarried pregnancy surgically removed from my body. It was a heartbreaking time and again, I am grateful that I had that choice and access to quality healthcare. 
Within just the past month, I have heard from friends and loved ones living in Vermont and elsewhere who have experienced the broad array of joys and sorrows that go along with reproductive choices and realities. For one same-sex couple, it's the good news of a long-awaited baby born with the support of fertility treatments. For a friend, it's the sadness of miscarrying early in her pregnancy and navigating her healthcare options in the aftermath of that loss. For another couple, it's the difficult decision to abort a fetus after prenatal testing revealed adverse health outcomes. Each day, people in all corners of our state and in this very congregation face questions and decisions like these about their reproductive health. The right to make decisions concerning one's reproductive life is affirmed by our Unitarian Universalist faith. Unitarian Universalist theology upholds the worth and dignity of every person and affirms the sacredness of our bodies and our sexuality in its many expressions. Our bodies and our sexuality aren't sources of shame. Instead, we believe that our bodies and our sexuality are sources of wholeness. And this faith affirms that bodily autonomy is foundational to human dignity and self-determination. Unitarian Universalist ethics asks us to also consider our interdependence with others and to look more closely at the issues of injustice and inequity at work within issues of reproductive rights. When we consider reproductive rights, we are certainly talking about questions and issues that lead to the decision to have an abortion as Brenda and Bronwyn so tenderly testified to in sharing their stories earlier in our service. And issues of reproductive health and reproductive rights also go beyond the right to have an abortion. In 2015, the Unitarian Universalist Association adopted a statement of conscience on reproductive justice. Unitarian Universalists had long worked to support reproductive freedom and choice. Reproductive justice, however, is distinct from reproductive freedom or reproductive choice. It is a framework that brings together reproductive rights, social justice, and human rights. This framework was developed in 1994 by a dozen Black women who had gathered in Chicago on their way to the International Conference on Population and Development in Cairo. They felt that the women's rights movement, led mostly by middle-class and wealthy white women, could not fully defend and represent the needs of women of color, other marginalized women, and trans people. In discussions of reproductive health, they didn't hear discussed how Black women's choices were so often constrained by things like income, housing, and the criminal justice system. They came together and formed a group called Women of African Descent in Reproductive for Reproductive Justice. And three years later, the organization Sister Song, based in Atlanta, Georgia, was established to create a national multi ethnic reproductive justice movement. Sister Song defines reproductive justice as the human right to maintain personal bodily autonomy, have children, not have children, and parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. This definition is significant given the long history that women of color in this country have faced of forced sterilization and medical experimentation, proximity to toxic environments, bans and restrictions on immigration, all of which have meant less reproductive freedom and autonomy. Gerald Hayes of If When How, 
an organization that works towards reproductive justice through the law and policy landscape, describes reproductive justice as an essential transformation of the systems and the institutions that perpetuate oppression into structures that realize justice and a future when all people can self-determine their reproductive lives free of discrimination, coercion, or violence. What would it mean for the people who currently face oppression, discrimination, coercion, and violence to be free of these conditions, to know true liberty and liberation? What needs to change so that we have societal structures that realize justice and a future when all people can self-determine their reproductive lives. At the moment, the right to access reproductive health services and especially abortion care is being restricted all across the country. And while this is happening here in Vermont, we have the opportunity to create stronger legal protections of our reproductive liberties with a proposed amendment to the state constitution. And you can stay on after the service, join our coffee hour to learn more about the reproductive liberty amendment, also called Proposition 5, and the campaign to bring that amendment to the ballot in November. Ensuring that liberty is protected is just one step towards realizing the full vision of liberation that recognizes the interconnection of racial justice, economic justice, gender justice, and environmental justice. When we work to create more affordable housing, we are working towards reproductive justice. When we work to address the climate crisis, we are working towards reproductive justice. When we work to raise the minimum wage to a living wage, we are working towards reproductive justice. And when we work to protect and expand the right to vote, we are working towards reproductive justice. We all want freedom. The freedom to live and love without fear or condemnation the freedom to be well in, and whole in body, mind, and spirit, the freedom to flourish in this brief but grace-filled life that we are so blessed to have on this precious earth. Our reproductive freedom is a necessary part of the wellness and flourishing that we all desire and that we all deserve and our collective liberation depends upon us fighting for a world that breaks down barriers to self-determination and that ensures that every person, family and community has what they need to flourish. Let us ground ourselves in a theology of love and liberation and work together to make it possible that all people have the rights, the respect, and the resources that they deserve. So may it be. Let us join now in our closing hymn. Thank you to the dozen or so people who gathered on the front steps of the church earlier this week to sing and record this song. We had a great time and the sound of traffic in the background was no match for our spirited singing. Please sing along.
As we draw our service to a close, we extinguish the chalice and carry within each of us its healing flame, the warmth of community, and the spark of hope into the days and the week ahead. Now, please join me in saying our congregational mission statement. We welcome all as we build a loving community to nurture each person's spiritual journey, serve human need, and protect the earth, our home. Our closing words today are written by Elizabeth Strong. Seek for the spirit of life that is within you, that you might know more fully its power and strength. Seek for the spirit of life that surrounds you, that you might know more fully its connection to you. Seek for the spirit of life that is within others, that you might enter more fully into the community that embraces us this day and every day. And we conclude our service with the postlude. 